And today we're in the Gospel of John, chapter 2. Now, today I actually feel like I'm on an episode of Mythbusters, okay? It's a little, little weird. I, you know, we all get a picture of God in our minds and, and Jesus, and it's often reinforced when we see paintings. You know, I've been to some, some beautiful places, some beautiful uh, cathedrals and, and churches and cities where they had paintings uh, where man gets an idea of what God's Word is saying and they, they paint it. And sometimes they're very beautiful. And then sometimes they're, they're not <laughs> exactly right. And one of the most dramatic of these is, is what most people call, the, we generally call it the cleansing of the temple. And that's where we pretty much picture Jesus running around, mad as a wet hen, got a whip in his hand, whipping people, people terrified, um, you know, and, you know, money flying everywhere from Jesus knocking over the tables and breaking them up. And, you know, there's this, out, there's this rage um, that happens. And, of course, it's a righteous rage. So we have to be righteous when we, uh, when we read that because Jesus wouldn't do an unrighteous rage. So, you know, <laughs> you think about people half dead after the tsunami came through. And in the text, I think you'll actually see a quite different picture of the Jesus that cleansed the temple. And so I'm going to be reading from the New King James Translation, uh, John chapter 2. We, last time we ended at verse 11, as Jesus had performed his first sign at the, in Cana of Galilee at the wedding, and his disciples believed in him. And so I'm going to pick it up at verse 12 and go through verse 18. Verse 12, after this, he went down to Capernaum, he, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples. They did not stay there many days. Now we see at this point, there was quite a group going with Jesus. Um, that included his mother, of course, Mary, his biological brothers, according to additional scriptures in multiple places. And, and you know, I love to see how scriptures address and, and actually squash false doctrines centuries before they arise. And, and in this case, there was a, a teaching that arose several centuries after this that uh, it said that Mary didn't have any other children. It said Mary was always a virgin. Um, the Roman Catholic Church is one of the main proponents of, of this thought. And it was somehow beyond that, it actually morphed into Mary being a co-redemptorist. In other words, you know, the redemption plan was not complete without Jesus and Mary being a part of it. She somehow played a part. And that, that came up during the Dark Ages. Now, more recent popes have actually, well, it's Catholic Church, right? <laughs> More recent popes have, have kind of pulled back on that idea. They, won't, they don't give her that title, but they don't, they don't denounce it either. Um, but they still deny that Jesus, I mean, that, that Jesus' mother, Mary, had marital relations with her husband, Joseph. And in fact, they say that even today, she's a virgin in heaven. So anyway, the wording here, and the wording in several other places in the scriptures makes it very clear that these are indeed the human brothers of Jesus. It's not just family or extended family. It wasn't uh, a reference to um, cousins in that, that case or uh, spiritual brothers. Hey, you know, you, you guys are my brothers here, but you know, it wasn't a reference to that kind of brother because it talks about the disciples. It talks about his mother, Mary, and his brothers. And later other places it talks about his mother, uh, Mary, his sisters, and his brothers. So the passage emphasizes to us, it does emphasize to us that Jesus respected, loved, cared for his mother, you know, took him with, took her with him. Uh, she was probably a widow at this point in time, but that she was a, a normal human being. She was a natural mother and had a normal family. So um, as, we, as we look at them going into Capernaum, John doesn't say what happened on the visit to Capernaum. However, some of the other synoptic gospels do. And, and I'm always wondering if he went there, there's a reason he went there. Why? Why did they put that in there? So Jesus did a lot of ministry in that area. Capernaum, some say that was kind of the headquarters of Jesus' ministry. Um, it was right there uh, on the Sea of Galilee. It was 200 feet below sea level. Uh, so was the Sea of Galilee, too. So, you know, it wasn't always getting flooded. But you see him teaching. And right, during this time... He, was actually, he actually went there, he taught in the synagogue, he performed some miracles for people. He had just been recently, you know, a few days earlier, had been uh, revealed as the Messiah. And so people were getting pretty excited about this Messiah that was coming. And 
And, uh, you know, it was during this trip on the way to Capernaum that, he, that Jesus saw Simon and Andrew along the Sea of Galilee, and they were out fishing again after they said they, you know, they wanted to be, they wanted to follow him, but they're out fishing. And at that point, that's where, where he says in, in Mark uh, chapter one, it says, passing along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he, Jesus, saw Simon, Peter, and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net to and fro in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Come after me and be my disciples, and I will make you to become fishers of men. I think at that point, when we talked before about that, uh, that kind of a eureka moment or the epiphany, it's like, oh, now I see what he's wanting me to do, or now I see the whole picture. And so it says in verse 18, all at once they left their nets, yielding up all claim to them, following with him, joining him as disciples and siding with his party. You can tell that's the amplified version. He went on a little farther and saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, putting their nets in order. And immediately he called out to them. And abandoning all mutual claims, they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men and went after him to be his disciples, side with his party and follow him. And they entered into Capernaum. And immediately on the Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and began to, pe began to peach. It was that peach tea I drank last night began to teach, and they were completely astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching as one who possessed authority and not as the scribes. So he was already establishing a ministry of authority here, and it's something to me that really stands out as the commitment level of these disciples at this point. It's a commitment level we don't often see. When y'all first heard about Jesus, and when you see people hear about Jesus, do you see them dropping everything, their livelihood, leaving their family. Well, it's their father. They're old enough to be on their own already. But, but doing all that, leaving their family business to go and follow this itinerant teacher, well, they did that. But the series of confirmations that he was the Messiah uh, that led up to this were so strong, word was spreading fast that the Messiah would finally come. And so um, just for some homework, read the rest of Mark uh, chapter one and see what all was happening there in Capernaum. Uh, leading up to this, what we're looking at today's teaching. So when he was getting finished at, at Capernaum for this particular visit, it says in verse 13, John 1, it says, Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, of course, the Passover uh, and the following feast were, that were going on was the highlight of the years for the Jews. Big time, a good Jewish man, Jesus was, and so he headed up to Jerusalem of 100 miles south of Capernaum. Now, when I go 100 miles south, I think about going down. But if you wonder why Jesus went up and his disciples went up to Jerusalem, um, he wasn't going north, as we suspect. He was actually going uphill. Almost any place in Israel you, you went to, you had to go up to Jerusalem. Now, there were a couple places a little higher in elevation, but you still had to go down the mountain, a couple mountains, but you went up to Jerusalem, it's 2,600 feet above sea level, more than twice as high above sea level as we are here. And so that's why the scriptures went up. So again, if people, you know, when you're, when you're wondering about things, that, that was very accurate in the scriptures. Another note you'll find here that the apostle John writes here and in other times, he says the Passover of the Jews. The Passover and the feasts were not called the Jewish Passover in the Hebrew scriptures. They weren't called the Jewish feasts in the scriptures. It was called the Passover to the Lord or Passover of the Lord or the Lord's Passover. And that is specifically using the Lord's name as we transliterated, I guess, Yahweh. It's, it's saying this is his Passover when it was instituted back in Exodus and as it was commanded to be, be followed and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. And I think... As John wrote this, it was just another one of those reinforcements that the system had been so corrupted to the true worship of God. Even Passover had lost its meaning to the point where it could no longer be called the Lord's Passover, but only could now be called a Jewish tradition. It's kind of sad to see that sort of thing happening. And, and the true and living God's, you know, he chose the people and he, he set this up so they would not forget him, yet they were forgetting him in a lot of ways. 
the Jews within 15 miles, from what I understand, were required to come to this feast. But they did come not only from there, but from all over Israel, uh, even from foreign countries. Uh, families that had, had gone into other countries came there. It was a huge deal. The population of Jerusalem exploded. Um, it's hard to tell exactly how many. We know there's many, many thousands. Uh, estimates right, run from uh, hundreds of thousands to actually in the millions of people. I'm not sure how they can pack all that many people in there, but it was big. They'd all come to the temple to offer sacrifices. They'd all come. Um, some had brought their sacrifices with them. Um, sheep, ox, some of the poor people, they could only bring doves or pigeons, which was allowed. However, on, with a long journey and riding on the, the animals, getting to that kind of elevation, uh, it was quite a burden. It could be just a huge burden to bring those animals up there. So what happened is God told them in Deuteronomy 14 that those that were coming from further away, could, they could sell the livestock, they could sell their grain, they could sell the wine they produced and save up the money, save up their tithe money and also the offerings that they were going to give and then they could bring it to the place of worship when they got to the temple and give the money there. So, you know, God is not mean. <laughs> he doesn't want to put an undue burden on us on getting, on allowing us to come to worship him. So he made it very easy for them. And even though they had some, some laws, he made it very easy for them to make that journey. Well, they got to the temple. The temple complex is about 19 acres. I did not calculate the acreage of this place here to tell you, you know, what it was in comparison. But it was pretty good size. 19 acres is pretty good size. The largest part was called the Court of the Gentiles that was outside. And the, of course, Gentiles are non-Jewish people. And the court was a place where the Gentiles could come, even though they weren't Jewish, they weren't allowed to make the sacrifices, they weren't allowed to, uh, you know, to participate in the Jewish ceremonies. They could come, they were encouraged to come to seek God, to pray, to worship the Lord. And it was a special place where God's people there could be a light to the other nations of the world. The other nations could come there and give God the glory for what they saw after they visited. They should, they should come, look for God, and worship the Lord. But um, it didn't always happen that way, as you'll see. Also remember that Judea was under Roman rule. Now, the money being used was Roman. Uh, remember when... Jesus asked them to take a look at the money, whose face is on it. What'd they say? Caesar's. Now this particular one is Roosevelt, it's a dime. <laughs> but the, the, the ruler's money was on, uh, the ruler's pictures or engravings were actually on the money. And when they came to the temple to pay for the, the offering, they had to, everyone had to pay half a shekel, uh, which was a Jewish coin as an offering to help pay for the operation of the temple. And um, my guess is that when they came in, they probably also were required to pay the tithes in the Jewish money as well. Because, I mean, honestly, if you have a graven image on a coin and you're taking that into the temple, that would be a problem. Because God says, don't make graven images. <laughs> so that's why all these people were out here changing money. They weren't doing it, initially they weren't doing it to rip people off. <laughs> Initially, they were doing it to honor the Lord's command not to have graven images. Well, the Jews also began the practice of inside that court of the Gentiles selling the oxen, the sheep, and the doves to those that came to Jerusalem. Um, and, but they, they did it in the, in the outer court, at the court of the Gentiles, started making it a marketplace, not only for exchanging the currencies, but also for selling livestock for sacrifices. And you see in verse 14, it says, And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. Okay, so, so here's what he saw. When Jesus came to the temple, through the court of the Gentiles, the place where the children of Abraham could bless the nations and be a light to the world, Jesus found a noisy, stinky place full of oxen, lambs, cages, crammed with, crammed with doves and pigeons, um, and all that came, I won't go into detail, all that came with thousands, you can picture hundreds of thousands uh, in, in many cases of these animals being sold there. It wasn't the most pleasant place to worship the Lord. But not only that, but the exchangers of the coins found they could make some pretty good money by exchanging the currencies above the real value of the money. 
After all, they knew, you know, they're, they're supposed to be experts, right? So you went in and you exchanged the money and they got ripped off. And they also had a monopoly in doing it. And you know, this temple had been being built for many years. The temple probably leaders, probably the political leaders that were in charge of the temple got a cut of it to help build more. So in essence, they were stealing right off the top the money that people had brought to God to worship him with and to give to him. And then the next thing Jesus saw was the, I call it the next racket. Um, dishonest priests would inspect livestock. If someone actually brought livestock to them, it had to be one without spot or blemish. It had to be perfect, the lambs or the oxen or the doves. And, and uh, so the, the priest would inspect it and they'd go over wherever bit, oh, looky there, you know, that hair is not white, it's gray, or that hair is, you know, black, or there is a spot on its paw. That's not acceptable for sacrifice. You have to go in there and you have to buy one of the sacrifices that one of our, our approved sacrifices that are in there. And, you know, they'd always find something wrong with the animals. They declare them unfit. So they go in there and people that had been there before, they kind of caught on. They didn't even bother bringing the livestock. They just knew what was gonna happen. Uh, they, they had incredibly high prices. Uh, this was amazing to me. Some of the historians estimate they charged 10 to 15 times the normal market price for these animals. It was terrible. You know, and all of this was happening where God's people were supposed to be a light to the nations that were coming in and doing this and, and trying to honor God. Well, in the last teaching we saw as Jesus was quietly moved with compassion at a wedding, uh, his friends were running out of wine and, and he fixed it. He saw something else that needed to be fixed here. Um, it wasn't going to happen quite with as much quiet compassion. It was compassion, but it wasn't the quiet compassion. Not only had the Jewish people begun to despise this religious, religious system, but they actually had gotten used to being ripped off. But in the name of God, you know, that, that's violating. It's interesting because, you know, in, in exchanging the coin to avoid violating uh, you know, you shall not make graven images, they were violating, you should not take the name of the Lord your God in vain because they were using God's name to rip people off. But they got used to being ripped off. Uh, some of the, I'm sure, some of the godly leaders that were there were really getting tired of it, hoping and praying that someone would put an end to, to this, these atrocities that were going on in the temple year after year. Um, they needed a miracle. They needed something amazing to happen. And you know, most people call this passage the, the cleansing of the temple, which it is, and we'll see that in a bit. And that's what Jesus is about to do. But, but I also, I, I think this is one of the signs, one of the miracles that Jesus did. Um, have you ever seen a situation that's gone so wrong and so unrighteous for so long, you say, only God can fix this thing. And we need a mess. You pray for a miracle to happen. I think we're about to see that here. Our life lesson is don't give up on God fixing unrighteous messes. Pray for his perfect timing to do so. Don't give up on God fixing unrighteous messes. Pray for his perfect timing to do so. See, at this point in text, just imagine we're, we're looking around the area. There's animals and junk lying around. We see Jesus get upset. I don't really see him getting mad here. I, I see him probably crying a little bit, you know, tears in his eyes, just seeing what had happened. Um, you know, he'd been here many times before in his adult. He'd seen what happened, but his time had not yet come. As we talked about last week, his hour had not yet come. Well, it's his hour. He began picking up some of the cords that people had dropped as the animals had been taken away for sacrifice. He started tying them together. You wonder, what's he thinking? as he's picking up all these cords. And verse 15 says, when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. So Jesus drove out all the money changers, all those that were selling the animals, all the sheep and oxen. Now, look at this, you know, see those, again, I see pictures, I, I looked at pictures of paintings of this event, even cartoons that, that kids are shown in Sunday school, and they all had, you know, like this wild man <laughs> out there and people fearing them. That wasn't what was happening. 
You know, the doves, you see doves flying all over. Doves were in cages. What did he say? The doves were in cages. They couldn't run out when Jesus, you know, was prodding them along. So he told the dove sellers, take them out of here. And what they do? They took them out. <laughs> you know, he wasn't, it wasn't, they didn't call temple uh, security <laughs> on him. And you got to realize, this, it must have been quite a sight. This was actually, to, to get a picture of the size of the court of the Gentiles, it was about the size of four football fields. I mean, we're not talking about a vestibule of a church. <laughs> we're talking about four football fields with all this stuff going on. And, um, you know, if, if it had been a wild man in there, they would have put him down pretty quickly. But no, no. Just imagine how long it took to clear this area. But he went through, he got the sheep, and that's how you got rid of, that's how you moved sheep and oxen. You know, you, you, prodded, you prodded them along with the, with the whips. That's what they're used to. Uh, but it, I don't know how long it took. It doesn't tell us how long it took. But he had all this talking to do. Every time there was a doves or pigeons in a cage, he had to talk, tell the people what was going on. Say, hey, those need to go out of here. This is my father's house. This is a house. This is not a house of merchandise. This is a house of prayer for the Gentiles. Get out of here. Move, take them out. And then, you know, he was explaining with his divine authority what had to be done. And he, I don't know how he organized it. We're not told how. It would be interesting to see how he went and made sure everything was done evenly. I'm sure it was, was done in a, a very organized fashion. But I also think that some of the leaders that were there that had been seeing this going on for years weren't quite sure how to fix it because of what the other ones would say or maybe even what the government would say that was trying to get this money. But uh, I think a lot of them were saying, thank God someone is finally fixing this problem after all these years. Now remember, we, we read in Malachi verses one to four, behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. That was John the Baptist. We read that when we we're studying about John the Baptizer. And the Lord's, and continuing verse two, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Now remember, they were very thrilled about Jesus being there, seeing his miracles, hearing his teaching. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years. Doesn't that make a lot of sense now? that we see what Jesus did here and that that prophesy, prophecy talks exactly to what Jesus had done here. It wasn't madness from a crazy man, a Messiah gone berserk or anything like that that we, we see. No, it was a long overdue restoration project. Jesus was there. Uh, he was the only one who could rightfully do such a thing. He'd been preparing himself for years and God had been preparing and now he was preparing and purifying the house of God getting out all the bad stuff. It's another step in the coming of the age of the Messiah, bringing in the new covenant, which we also call the New Testament, uh, or, or God's new agreement with us to do things differently. We see something else in verse 16. Uh, we just read uh, in, in John, it says, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Now, obviously the temple grounds was the wrong place for what was going on. But what was very interesting about this in the, in, a Jewish, in the Jewish tradition, when you're getting ready for Passover and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, each family went through at least a week before the uh, before Passover began, and they'd go through and get out, get out every speck of leaven in their house. Okay, yeast, basically. And they still do to this day. They're doing that. I mean, they'll take toothpicks and, you know, scrape any... any cracks that a piece of leaven may have gotten into. And it was a huge deal. It began a whole week. The whole family was involved. Um, you know, usually, of course, the parents led. Uh, usually the, the oldest son took the lead in making sure the family took care of business there. But you, won't, you know, what's, why is that all? Why did they do that? Well, leaven in the Bible represents sin. Always represents sin. No matter where you find it, it always represents sin. All the sin had to be removed from the homes before Passover. Today in our text, what do we see? 
we see the only begotten Son of the Heavenly Father once again doing his Father's business, going in, cleaning out the leaven piece by piece, herd by herd, cage by cage, table by table, getting out all the sin out of his Father's house in preparation for the Passover. And then we read in verse 17, then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. You know, we mentioned Jesus had been coming to the Passover in Jerusalem for a number of years. I mean, he was, he was an adult. Um, he'd seen what was going on. He'd seen how wrong it had been. Knowing it was God's intention for his father's house to be a house of prayer, worship, and light for all the nations to the glory of God. But it'd been on his radar for many years. But removing the corruption, it was more than just removing the corruption that had overtaken the great feast. It was beyond cleaning up these things, cleaning up the, these uh, defilement, basically, of the holy ground that these people were perpetrating. We see a preparation for a brand new day. Why didn't he do it two years before, five years before? It wasn't his hour. Now, it's a brand new day. Soon, thousands, these thousands and thousands of oxen and doves and, and sheep, and lambs would no longer be slaughtered for the forgiveness or the covering of sin. The blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God that we've been studying about, would provide full payment for the sin of the entire world. That includes you and me. That includes those that were standing in the temple that day. Every one of us. Our life lesson is when Jesus cleaned out his father's house, it was to make room for you and me. When Jesus cleaned out his father's house, it was to make room for you and me. We also see that Jesus poured the money changers' money out and overturned the tables. Didn't say he broke them up and terrorized people. He didn't beat them, you know, or anything like that. He just pushed them over. He poured he poured out the money. I mean, he just that was interesting. It's like, oh, okay, if you just knock the tables off, it would have fallen. But it said he poured the money out. It reminds me of how later he poured out his blood as an atonement for our sins. That was the price to pay for our sins. It wasn't the money in the bags that he was pouring out and getting rid of there. You know, he wasn't trying to steal money. He wasn't forcing them to, to do anything with it, but he just dumped it out on the ground. Again, I think that's a piece of this new era, the new covenant that he's ushering in. Isaiah 55, one says, and they had read that, it says, hope everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You who have no money, come buy and eat. In the Old Covenant, it didn't matter whether you were rich or poor. You still had to pay the same money when you brought your sacrifice into the temple. Whether you had it or not, you, you, you had to find some. You had to pay that tax. Um, and, you know, your, your sacrifice still had to be brought, still had to be slaughtered for, for, for a covering of your sin. But that money is useless today. Isaiah 55 said, you know, you who have no money, come, buy and eat. No amount, no amount of money can buy the forgiveness of our sins. In fact, no money is required for those who will still come to the living water, Jesus, for their forgiveness. Our life lesson here is that Jesus paid the price, the full price, for our sins to be forgiven. Jesus paid the price, the full price, for our sins to be forgiven. Now next week we'll begin the teaching at verse 18, but I'd like to read read that here to make it clear that even though some may question why did Jesus want to do this? Why did uh, he, he do this? Well, it seemed that those that were in authority, earthly authority in the temple, didn't question them. So in verse 18 they said, so the Jews answered and said to him, what sign do you show us? Do you show to us since you do these things? They didn't ask by what authority did you do them? I think they knew this was the Messiah. They simply asked him for a sign. <laughs> and we, we read later on about, uh, you know, people always looking for a sign, you know, just believe. Uh, so anyway, next week we'll see that that sign uh, was incredi incredibly appropriate for the actions taken. We'll see the sign that Jesus gave them and uh, we'll, we'll dig into the, some of those meetings and, and finish up uh, chapter two next week. Um, and you know, when I, when I first thought about this passage and, and teaching this, I, I thought, how, how was I going to 
explain why Jesus got so mad and, and justify um, the abuse maybe and, uh, of the people that were there and, and disregarding the authority of those in charge. But, you know, that's a misconception from just reading over a passage and not studying it. The more I studied it, the more I realized I'd had the wrong picture in my mind about this cleansing of the temple. This was an incredible act of love and compassion and, and preparation that, that Jesus did. And uh, I, I had to say, I was wrong. You know, and we, we talk about that most weeks is that if, if we have some preconceived notions and the Bible teaches this other way, yeah, what do we change? We change our, our own minds and our hearts. So um, it was hard to justify to me. It was hard to look at where we kept seeing John talk about grace and truth and, you know, and the light that Jesus was providing and then see something violent happen. But it wasn't that way at all. It was just something that had been built up um, I think just, just through not understanding and not studying enough. So um, I, I repent of not studying enough. And uh, I want to read, I want to study more. And we're, we're going to see that uh, that grace and truth in the first chapter that, that uh, was written about did not change in the second chapter when Jesus cleansed the temple. Our final life lesson is actually verbatim from Hebrews 13.8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday yesterday today and forever. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God loves you. He wants to bury your sins. He wants to get rid of it. He wants to drive it out completely. Create that new life in you every day. He wants to renew your heart day by day. He's always wanted to do that in your life. And if you haven't done that yet today, today's the right time to do that in your life. You know, last week we saw Jesus make a miracle happen in an instant. And he can do the same. He can come into your life and change that in an instant. The Bible says, believe him, trust him, cling to him, rely on him, and he will do what he promised. It all starts by confessing those shortcomings, your sins to God, and he'll forget those things. And he'll, it, all, it also says that when you confess your sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Just like he cleansed the corruption out of the temple, made it clean, made it new, made it ready for a wonderful work, uh, restoration to where it should have been in the beginning. He will do that in our lives. So I just encourage you, if, if you haven't done so, or if you haven't done so today, and you know, things are, uh, have stacked up, anything in your life, just confess that to the Lord. You can say something like, God, I confess to you that I've sinned. I've done wrong things, thought wrong thoughts, and not done the things that are pleasing to you. Please forgive me of all that and clean my heart and life. And I accept Christ again today, a new day as my Lord. Thank you for bringing me into the family of God. Amen. So I encourage you to continue to get to know and believe in Jesus more and more through that study, through the reading of God's word, through prayer, and ask God for wisdom to understand um, on this venture that I'm going into here. It's just more and more, uh, you know, I find myself just asking God, uh, you know, show me what you have not only for those that are coming to hear, but for, for me, because I need to understand you more in my life. Next week, again, we'll pick up in verse 19, and we'll learn how to build a temple in just three days. <laughs> okay? If you have any questions about uh, uh, this, or if you have anything to pray, you need prayer for, please feel free to, to talk with us, contact us, don't hesitate. And uh, I want to bless you this time. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you again for being here.